session on deep learning neural network architecture. Um, our first talk is uh, by Michel Stern, and he'll be talking about at a factor, adaptive learning rates with sublinear memory cost. Hi everyone, my name is Mitchell Stern and I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley. Today I'd like to tell you about Adafactor, an adaptive learning method with sublinear memory cost. This project was joint work with Noam Shazir during an internship at Google Brain. It's widely known that gradient-based optimization forms the backbone of most modern approaches used to train deep neural networks. I'd like to start off with a brief review of some of the most popular methods, grouping them by their auxiliary memory usage. First, we have the simplest gradient-based method, stochastic gradient descent. This requires no additional storage beyond the parameters themselves. Next, we have momentum methods like the heavy ball method and Nesterov's accelerated gradient method. These require one auxiliary parameter per model parameter. Orthogonally, there are also a number of adaptive methods which maintain method about pass gradients to compute per parameter learning rates. These include Adagrad, Adadelta, and RMS prop. Lastly, there are several methods that combine momentum and adaptivity. This group includes the popular Adam method along with some recent variants such as NADAM and AMS grad. While practitioners have found these methods to empirically outperform SGD across a variety of domains, their superior performance does come at a cost. Recent work has shown that for problems where vast quantities of data are available, such as language modeling and machine translation, task performance improves consistently as model size increases, even in the regime of models with several billions of parameters. As models continue to grow, the storage requirements of one or two auxiliary parameters per model parameter imposed by existing adaptive methods can be prohibitive, motivating the investigation of a low memory alternative. In this talk, we propose a novel learning algorithm called Adafactor, in which model structure is exploited in order to reduce uh, storage requirements without compromising empirical performance. The exact space complexity varies with model architecture but is roughly order square root of n for typical deep learning architectures. Before going into the details of our algorithm, I'll briefly review Adam and highlight some of the points where Adafactor differs. Adam is a stochastic optimization algorithm proposed by King Ma and Ba in 2015, which combines ideas from momentum methods and adaptive methods. In each iteration, we first compute the gradient on the current mini batch of data, Next, we update our exponential moving average estimate of the first moment of the gradient and do the same for the component-wise second moment of the gradient. Following this, we perform a bias correction step to account for the fact that we initialized our estimates of the moments with zero. And finally, we compute an update vector by dividing the first moment estimate by the square root of the second moment estimate plus a small constant to avoid division by zero and we update our parameters by subtracting this update vector scaled by a small learning rate from the previous parameters. Keeping that structure in mind, I'll next give a quick overview of Adafactor as it relates to Adam before giving a more detailed explanation. We'll assume for simplicity of presentation that the model parameters form a single matrix and we'll accordingly use capital letters in our notation. In practice, for deep models with multiple groups of parameters, the steps we describe here are applied independently in parallel to each group. As an atom, we first compute the gradient on the current mini batch of data. Due to other changes that I'll describe shortly, we find empirically that we can remove momentum with little effect on performance. This saves as many auxiliary parameters as there are model parameters. We still retain information about the second moment of the gradient for adaptivity, but rather than storing a full moving average, we instead use a low rank approximation, helping to reduce memory usage from n times m for an n by m matrix to n plus m. More details about that soon. We additionally circumvent the need for a bias correction step through the use of a time varying 
coefficient beta 2 for the exponential moving average of the gradient's second moment. Next, we compute an update vector as before and perform update clipping to prevent divergence from updates that are too large. And finally, we take a step to update our parameters. We use relative step sizes scaled according to parameter magnitudes to help achieve some robustness to different choices regarding initialization and scaling within deep networks. So to summarize the key changes of add a factor relative to Adam, we use factored second moment estimation to redu uh, reduce auxiliary memory usage. We have a beta two that varies with time. We perform update clipping to avoid divergence from abnormally large updates. We use relative step sizes, and as a result of these changes, we're able to disable momentum with little effect on training performance. Now let's take a look at each of these in more detail. One of our key contributions is the use of factored second moment estimation for a drastic reduction in auxiliary memory usage. Suppose a subset of our parameters X forms a matrix in our model, for instance, for use within a feed forward layer. Denote the second moment estimate of the subset obtained via exponential moving averaging by V. We'd like to identify a low rank representation of V as a product of two factors R and S, which is compatible with exponential moving averaging. Intuitively, what I mean by this is that we would like a factorization where the factors of the exponential moving average V are equal to exponential moving averages of the factors themselves. This would allow us to store just the factors across iteration, cutting down on memory usage. More formally, if we denote our factorization as F mapping V to the pair RS, we'd like F applied to beta times the previous V plus one minus beta times the current square gradient to be equal to beta times F of the previous V plus one minus beta times F of the current squared gradient. And note that this condition is exactly equivalent to F being a linear mapping. To achieve this, we turn to a technique from non-negative matrix factorization, which is required in this case because we'll be dividing the gradient by the component-wise square root of our approximation. In particular, we would like to solve the following optimization problem. Minimize over factors R and S the sum of element-wise divergences between the true matrix V and our approximation RS, subject to the constraints that R and S are non-negative matrices. We use the I divergence here, defined as D of PQ equals P times log of P over Q minus P plus Q, as it is a common choice in non-negative matrix factorization, and it yields a pleasingly simple solution. In particular, for the case of rank one factors, the solution set of this optimization problem can be characterized as the set of all pairs RS whose product is equal to the expression shown. The right-hand side can be broken down into the following terms. V times a vector of M1s, which is the vector of row sums of V, a vector of N1s times V, which is the vector of column sums of V, and in the denominator, the sum of all entries of V. Fortunately, these components are all linear functions of V, meaning they commute with exponential moving averaging and are exactly suitable for our purposes. Here's what Adam looks like with factored second moment estimation for a matrix parameter where we've disabled momentum for simplicity. Note that we only need to keep track of the moving averages of the row and column sums of the squared gradient. From these, we can compute the full second moment estimate used for gradient scaling on the fly. Again, I'd like to reiterate that although this estimate is a product of factors, this procedure produces exactly the same rank one estimate of V as would be obtained by keeping a full moving average of V and recomputing the factorization for each iteration. Our next set of changes comes from the following empirical issue observed by us and others when training models with Adam. When the second moment moving average coefficient beta two is low, convergence suffers and results can be considerably worse. For instance, when training a state-of-the-art machine translation model, lowering beta two from 0 0.999 to 0 0.9 results in a large seven point decrease in blue score. 
This observation is corroborated by recent theoretical work by Reddy et al. on convergence issues present in vanilla atom. On the other hand, when beta 2 is high, training can be unstable. In fact, for the same task, a non-monotonic learning rate is required to avoid divergence, where the learning rate starts at zero, increases to a maximum value during a warm-up period, then gradually decays thereafter. To gain a little more insight into this instability, we chose a matrix within the aforementioned model and tracked the root mean square of its components during the early stages of training with Adam. If the second moment estimate is accurate, we would expect the update vector ut to have components close to one. We observe this is indeed the case when beta two is low, uh, that's the red curve, but there is significant fluctuation when beta two is high, that's the blue curve. When the root mean square is significantly larger than one, this indicates that updates are larger than we'd expect, and we believe this is a key contributor to instability. To address this phenomenon, we propose two fixes. The first is update clipping, where we scale down the update vector for a given matrix whenever its root mean square exceeds some threshold value d. Note that this is similar to, but slightly different from, the common practice of gradient clipping. Whereas gradient clipping only ensures that the gradient never gets too large, but places no bound on the size of the update vector obtained by dividing the gradient by the second moment estimate, we ensure that the actual update vector never gets too large in our scheme. This distinction often makes a difference in practice. The second fix is to use an increasing schedule for beta two where we start from zero and increase toward one as training progresses to achieve the best of both worlds. In particular, we consider the family of schedules beta two equals one minus one over t to the c and show in our paper that any of these is suitable in theory as long as c is less than or equal to one. As an added bonus, by starting the schedule from zero, the initial value of the accumulator is completely ignored and we're able to avoid the need for a bias correction step. Lastly, we take a hint from Jeff Hinton and others in the community who suggest that training tends to work well if the magnitudes of the parameter updates are roughly 10 to the minus two to 10 to the minus three times the magnitudes of the parameters themselves. We consider the use of relative step sizes as a practical implementation of this piece of folk wisdom. In particular, for each matrix in the model, we multiply the learning rate by the current root mean square of the parameters capped below by a small epsilon to ensure that this works even for uh, parameters initialized with all zeros. We find that this change can improve the robustness of our algorithm to different choices of initialization and scaling within deep networks. To evaluate the effectiveness of our approach, we ran a number of comparative experiments on an English-German machine translation task using the state-of-the-art transformer model. We used the WMT 2014 data set and we trained our models on Google TPUs for 100,000 steps. Due to resource limitations, we used a slightly smaller batch size than the one used in the original transformer paper, which significantly sped up training at the cost of a slight decrease in performance. This table summarizes our first set of results on the development set. The first two rows establish baseline results for Adam with and without momentum, corresponding to the non-zero and zero values for beta one, respectively. We note that the results with a warm-up period are similar either with or without momentum. However, removing the warm-up period leads to a decrease of over two blue points when momentum is used and leads to total divergence without momentum. We'll see later that Adifactor allows for a stable training under all of these settings. We also ran experiments with smaller values of beta two, finding that performance suffers heavily, but stability does improve somewhat as we decrease beta two. For comparison, we also ran experiments using SGD with a number of different learning rate schedules, finding that the model fails to train in most cases and is unable to reach comparable performance when it does converge. For the first modification, we have results for Adam with factored second moment estimation. 
We note that the results in row C are similar to the numbers obtained under comparable settings in row A, indicating that we can still train well with factored second moments. Rows D and E include results under some alternate simplified estimation schemes discussed in more detail in the paper. Next, we include update clipping with thresholds of one or two for atom and a threshold of one for atom with factored second moments. When warm-up is used, results stay roughly the same, but without warm-up, we're actually able to train to lower but non-zero performance with a threshold of one. Gradient clipping was not nearly as effective here. Next, we ran experiments for Adam with increasing beta two, finding that this modification similarly allowed for successful training without warm-up for certain schedules, and even gave a slight improvement in performance when combined with update clipping for training with a warm-up period. Lastly, we have experiments using all of the modifications, including relative step size, and this is our algorithm. In row O, we find that the standard adifactor algorithm attains satisfactory results with or without warm-up, and is actually better without warm-up, unlike all previous experiments. In row P, we also try enabling momentum but we find that it does not improve performance in either case, meaning the associated memory overhead is not worthwhile. Based on these experiments, we recommend the listed hyperparameters for Adifactor. Relatively small regularization constants, an update clipping threshold of d equals one, a relative step size that is constant at 10 to the minus two for 10,000 steps, then starts to decay like square root of t, and a schedule for beta two that starts at zero and approaches one as one t minus t to the negative 0 0.8. Using these hyperparameters for adifactor and the best hyperparameters from before for Adam, we ran further experiments with a larger, more realistic batch size under different settings for the initialization scale and the multiplier used for the embedding matrix within the model. We find that adifactor not only outperforms Adam in all three settings, but also exhibits greater robustness to differently scaled parameter matrices, thanks in large part to its use, <coughs> use of relative step sizes. Finally, I'd also like to mention that in ongoing work by some colleagues at Google Brain, these experimental findings have been reproduced for LSTM-based sequence-to-sequence models and also on other large-scale sequence tasks. This suggests that Adifactor works well as a low memory alternative to Atom across a number of different settings. So to conclude, in this talk, we proposed Adifactor, an adaptive learning method with sublinear memory cost. We showed that Adifactor is capable of matching the performance of Atom on industrial scale deep learning problems. Uh, and also our code is fully open source and can be found in the tensor to tensor repository on GitHub. So thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions now. So we have time for one or two questions. Okay. Uh, so I have a question. Um, what if, like, the thing that you did with this... Uh, uh, factor to compute, you know, to compute the factor of this G-square, do you think if you replace the G-square by some other matrix like Hessian or Gauss-Newton approximation, do you think all these tricks still go through? Um, that's an interesting question. We haven't looked into uh, any other adaptive matrices like that, but I suspect given how well it worked here, um, at least for certain tasks, you would see similar performance. Let's see. Any other question anybody else might have? All right, let's thank the speaker again. <coughs>
with scaled Kaylee transform. All right, thank you. Um, I'm Kyle, I'm here to present the paper Orthogonal Recurrent Neural Networks with Scaled Kaylee Transform, which is a new architecture designed to maintain a strict orthogonal recurrent weight matrix. Now recently there have been many different architectures out there that have either maintain a unitary or orthogonal recurrent weight matrix. So I'm not here to claim that this architecture is inherently better than all the other architectures. But what I feel comfortable in saying is that this architecture is really simple. Uh, the intuition behind it is pretty straightforward. Uh, implementation is really easy. No need for a long uh, product of rotational matrices. And based on the experiments, it's competitive. I'm not sure why I have the banner, but I'm going to go with it. Okay, so the things I'm going to talk about is first, uh, I'm going to talk about the motivation behind unitary orthogonal recurrent neural networks, which is the vanishing exploding gradient problem, followed by the mathematical tool used in this architecture, the Cayley transform, and then the architecture itself, which is called SCORN, and finally with some of the experiments that we, that if I have time to get through. Okay, so looking at the vanishing exploding gradient problem a little bit closer, here on the screen, I have a vanilla recurrent neural network uh, with a single hidden layer. For notational purposes, x of t is my input at a particular time, h is my hidden state, o is my output, and w is my recurrent weight matrix. So to update these weights, we do something called backpropagation through time. And here on the top of the screen are the um, uh, gradient terms for the recurrent weights. And so the vanishing exploding gradient issue comes into factor or into play with these terms highlighted in red, the derivative of your loss function with respect to the hidden state. So if we look at these a little more closely um, and make the simplification that we're going to look at an architecture with only a final output at the end of the sequence, uh, these gradient terms look like the bottom of the slide. And so what happens as you back propagate further and further in back into your net, uh, the time sequence, you have an increasingly many number of multiplications of this recurrent weight matrix W. So if your spectral radius of this W is greater than one, your gradients are going to become unbounded. If the spectral radius of this matrix is less than one, your gradients are going to go to zero, hence the vanishing exploding gradient problem. So one way to mitigate this is if your W matrix is unitary or orthogonal, so it has a um, spectral radius of one, in that case, you avoid the expansion and contraction of your gradient terms, and you can think of your W matrix as like a rotational matrix. So now that we have the motivation, uh, the next step is the talk about the mathematical idea behind SCORN, and it all boils down to this very simple idea. There's a theorem in linear algebra which states that every, any real orthogonal matrix W that does not have any negative one eigenvalues, I can parameterize this matrix using a skew symmetric matrix, A, through the Cayley transform. And the Cayley transform is basically the I plus A inverse times I minus A. So the whole idea is why not parameterize our current weight matrix using a, a, the Cayley transform. Of course, the major drawback is stated in the theorem itself, because what happens if our optimal orthogonal weight matrix has eigenvalues that are close to negative one or equal to negative one? So even though we can theoretically get as close as possible to represent such a matrix, the issue is the skew symmetric matrix and the entries of that corresponding matrix will become unbounded. So here I have a simple example of an orthogonal matrix W with close to negative one eigenvalues and the corresponding skew symmetric matrix A has entries on about 450. So if you're using an iterative update step, you might not ever be able to reach the optimal skew symmetric matrix A, and hence not the optimal orthogonal matrix W. So how can we overcome this? So one way to do this, well fortunately, a few years ago, there was a theorem proved by Adorni and Kahn, which states that if I have any orthogonal matrix W, irrespective of how many negative one eigenvalues there are, there exists a skew symmetric matrix A, such that if I perform the Cayley transform on this matrix, and apply a scaling matrix D, then I will be able to uh, represent this, the desired orthogonal matrix W. And as an added bonus, they also showed that they proved that there exists uh, this skew symmetric matrix A such that the entries, the modulus of the entries are bounded by one. So we now can avoid the explosion of our skew symmetric matrix entries. And D is a diagonal matrix 
consisting of appropriate number of positive ones and negative ones. So now that we have a way to parameterize our current weight matrix, we have to pass our gradients through the scaled Cayley transform. And that's done here in this theorem. And so fortunately, by construction, the resulting gradient uh, matrix, DLDA, is itself skew symmetric. And since the addition or subtraction of any two skew symmetric matrices is going to be skew symmetric itself, we can use any standard additive update scheme, such as Adam or uh, add a factor. And so, um, so the new, when you update using this gradient, your new A matrix is going to be skew symmetric. So if you perform the scaled Cayley transform on this A matrix, you're guaranteed to have an orthogonal matrix. So you will always have a strictly orthogonal matrix within machine precision. So to look at the architecture itself, first we update our skew symmetric matrix A using the formulation on the last slide. Then we update, reformulate our W matrix using the scaled Cayley transform. And the rest of the architecture is just like a standard recurrent neural network. Uh, but I should note the only difference is, is that we tried many different activation functions on this scheme. And we had the best luck using a activation function called the mod ReLU, which was first created by Arjovsky. And they created it to get an activation function similar to the ReLU, but in the unitary case for imaginary uh, activation values, or complex activation values. But in the real case for SCORN, you can think of it as just simply a ReLU being multiplied by positive one or negative one. So in this case, uh, we think it's better because not only do you get zero and positive activation values, you get negative, zero, and positive activation values. And like everything else, initialization is very important of your skew symmetric matrix A. So we use this block diagonal scheme which was created in such a way such that if you perform the Cayley transform on this A matrix, the resulting matrix will have eigenvalues uniformly distributed on the unit disk in the complex plane. And so what happens is when you hit that with a scaling matrix D, the negative ones will reflect the corresponding eigenvalues across the imaginary axis. So if you have 50% ones, 50% negative ones, your uh, orthogonal matrix W will have eigenvalues uniformly distributed on the complex unit disk. Okay. okay, experiments. So the experiments we looked at were the copying problem, adding problem, MNIST and permuted MNIST, and Timmet problem. So I don't, I'm not going to have time to go through all of them. I highly recommend you look at the paper or come to the poster. Uh, for the copying problem, the SCORN architecture performed better than all the other ones we looked at for the longer sequence length. Uh, for the adding problem, it finished in the top three. For Timmet, it also outperformed all the other architectures we looked at. And I'm going to focus on the MNIST and permuted MNIST because I'm hoping that that's the most familiar uh, problem type. So here's the table of our results. And I've highlighted our best performing architecture, which is the SCORN with a hidden size of 512. Okay, so our best um, accuracy that we got you, um, is 0.985 on the um, regular MNIST problem. You, you see, unfortunately, the LSTM still outperforms SCORN, and it, but I should note it also outperforms all the other orthogonal recurrent neural networks that we looked at, with SCORN doing quite well uh, comparatively. Um, but I should also note it takes the LSTM much longer for it to have a significant increase in accuracy. And if you look over at the permuted MNIST experiment, which is what an experiment where we apply a fixed permutation to both the training and test set, um, you can see that SCORN outperformed all the other architectures. And here's the graph of our, that results. And you can see the LSTM is the red line, and it took much longer for it to get um, higher accuracy. And so that's about all I have. So if you can please, if you're interested, come to poster session 103. Check out the paper. We have our code, a link to our code on the paper. Um, yeah, and that's about it. So we have time for one question. And the next speaker, please try to start setting up here. Hi, I have uh, one question. Um, so yeah, so this looks like an elegant way of getting orthogonal matrices. Um, the, so this seems to be handling the vanishing gradient and exploding gradient, as you explained. But what about uh, activations? Because like, if you have ReLUs, then the ReLUs are going to slowly uh, kill everything, especially if you stay normalized so that everything that has been uh, reduced to zero by the ReLU 
cannot be uh, expanded again. So don't you get some uh, decay because of roll use? Um, we, we tried many different railers. We didn't look at it in too detail because we had better success with the mod railer. Uh, okay, but I mean just, did you observe the phenomenon of ReLU trying to also decay the signal addition to, uh, well in this case, just the ReLU because there's no uh, decay from the matrices? Um, we didn't have any uh, major issues with Raylo, so it worked. Um, maybe we can talk uh, a little bit later. Yeah. Let's thank, thank the speaker again. So our next speaker is C. Joe Joes, and he's going to talk, <laughs> sorry, I hope I didn't mess your name up again. Uh, and he's going to talk about Kronecker recurrent units. Hi everyone, I'm Sijo. I'm here to present Kronecker recurrent units, and this is a joint work with uh, uh, Mustafa Sisse and my PhD supervisor, Franz Rokulre. So our work is inspired by two uh, scenarios that arises in the context of deep learning. First one is deep neural networks are over parameterized. That is, these models have way more parameters than the data points on which it is trained on. And the second one, learning is difficult in these models because the weight matrices that parameterizes this model become ill-conditioned during the course of training, which might result in vanishing and exploring gradients. We study this problem in the context of recurrent neural networks and come up with a solution to tackle these problems to a certain extent. So let's begin. So let's do a case study on RNN about the parameter inefficiency issue. So the table illustrates how the number of parameters in an RNN and LSTM grows as we increase the hidden dimension. We can see that the number of parameters increases as the square of the hidden dimension. So this is a simple problem on, uh, for character of language modeling on Pendry Bank dataset. So we can see that uh, for a fairly uh, 1,000 dimensional uh, RNN problem, we have around uh, uh, for half a million parameters for LSTM and close to one million parameters for RNN. So our next problem is that when the recurrent weight matrices are ill-conditioned, the gradients may explode or vanish. Let us illustrate this problem by using a simple recurrent neural network. Given a sequence of t vectors, x1, x2, up to x capital T, at times of t, a, sim a recurrent neural network performs the following operation. That is, it takes the input xt, do a linear transformation using input to hidden uh, weight matrix U, add this value to the previous uh, hidden state, transform by using the recurrent weight matrix to get the Z vector, which is then, which on which a pointwise nonlinear activation function is applied to get the next hidden state. The predictions at the downstream of T are extracted by using the hidden to output matrix V, again by using a linear transform. And let L be the loss function that we are minimizing. By the chain rule of backpropagation and by applying cauchy schwarz inequality, we can derive the, we can show the inequality in the equation number four. So from this inequality, we can see that the, the norm of the gradient of the loss with respect to the hidden state at times of t dip, depends on two factors. First one is the norm of the Jacobian matrix of the nonlinear activation function. And the second one, the norm of the recurrent weight matrix, W. So from this, we can uh, infer that uh, the, when the singular values of the recurrent weight matrix deviates from one, the gradient may explore or vanish exponentially fast along the time horizon because we have an exponential dependency on the uh, uh, singular values of the recurrent weight matrix. So how can we tackle poor conditioning? One simple strategy would be like stay, uh, control the singular values of the recurrent weight matrix. That is stay close to the unitary manifold during the optimization. But this is computationally very expensive. It scales as order of n cube. We need to do a projection back to the unitary manifold which is very expensive. So with that, let's go to some of the previous works which try to tackle this uh, two problems, either one of them or both. Let's begin with LSTM. LSTM presented the uh, gating mechanism, which controls the flow of gradients along the time horizon, uh, time horizon, which, uh, time horizon, which prevents vanishing and exploding gradients to some extent. And recently, there have been a bunch of methods proposed uh, 
which tries to tackle the vanishing and exploding gradient problem by using orthogonal or unitary recurrent wave matrix as we have seen in the previous talk. So this method either explicitly parameterize the recurrent wave matrix to be unitary or they uh, do projected SGD to project the recurrent weight matrix back to the unitary manifold during the optimization in order to prevent vanishing and exploding gradient problem. Among some of these methods are parameter revision in sense you can have a very fine grain control of the number of parameters because uh, by way the matrices are parameterized you can uh, instead of uh, order of n squared growth we can have a sub quarterly growth. So with that, let's go into our method. So, so we present uh, what, what we call as Kronecker recurrent units or CRU. Our core idea is like to factorize the recurrent weight matrix as a Kronecker product of F matrices, where each of these F matrices is uh, constrained to be very small dimensional. So by choosing the number of uh, parameters F, we can have a very fine grain control of the number of parameters that we want to parameterize the recurrent weight matrix. For example, when f is 1, we recover the standard recurrent neural network with the order of n squared parameters. When, when f is uh, in the order of log n, we get a parameterization with order of uh, log n parameters. And we can choose all the chronicle parameterization in between depending upon the computational budget that we have at our disposal. So we achieve better conditioning of the model by using a soft unitary constraint that we do not optimize strictly on the unitary manifold. And the reason is that all the strict orthogonal unitary methods suffer from the retention of noise over time. Since this, uh, uh, is a fully, since these operators are fully unitary, if we have a noise back in time, the noise would not alternate and this, we suffer from the retention of noise which, of, uh, which uh, adversarially affects the op optimization process. So one of the advantages of the sort of Kronecker factorization and the soft unitary constraint is that we can apply this very efficiently for the Kronecker, Kronecker products. The reason, and this is because of the elegant properties of Kronecker matrices, that is if each of these factors of the Kronecker uh, products are, is uh, orthogonal or unitary, then the full matrix which is expanded by using the Kronecker product will also be orthogonal or unitary. It's, uh, it's an elegant property of uh, Kronecker products. So if each of the factors are approximately uh, unitary or orthogonal, then the full matrix will be unitary or orthogonal. And uh, our, uh, our model is very flexible, and this is a byproduct of Kronecker factorization. That is, we can have a very fine-grained control over the number of parameters from order of log n to n squared, depending upon the computational budget. And because of the nature of the Kronecker algebra, uh, uh, we can do the matrix vector product between the uh, recurrent weight matrix and the hidden state in uh, subquadratic time, depending on the number of parameters. So with that, we go into the experiments. We we present a subset of experiments in this talk, and there are much more much more experiments in the paper and uh, come to our post session later. So we here we describe the adding problem. Here our goal is to predict the sum of two marked numbers after an arbitrary long time gap, and this is a standard problem where the community used to evaluate the performance of uh, recurrent neural networks. And all the baseline methods are carefully chosen from the previous literature on orthogonal RNN and LSTMs. And as we can see that uh, uh, our method uh, performs, uh, converges much faster than previous uh, approaches with much fewer parameters. And this is combined with the, with the, uh, with our soft unitary constraints and uh, way our model is being parameterized. Next, we go into the polyphonic music modeling. Uh, here in the graph, we illustrate how the validation loss improves uh, as the training time progresses. We measure all, all our methods using, all the methods using uh, on the, you know, the same computer using the same wall clock running time. And as we can see that uh, it converges faster than many of, than the baseline. So next we go to the uh, framework phonic classification on TIMIT, where the similar observation, uh, we get the similar observation, where with much fewer parameters, we can get close to the state of art performance. With that, I conclude my talk. So our poster today is at the 8.15, Hall B, number 49. Thank you.
Great. So while the next speaker is setting up, we can take one question. We have to be very quick. And maybe I'll ask the question. Did you actually study some uh, invariance properties of your network? Does it, because it improves ill conditioning, so I'm guessing maybe it also has some effect on invariance. Understand the okay, the maybe I can yeah. take this offline later on. <laughs> Great. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> so our next speaker is Jack Ray, and he's going to talk about fast parametric learning with activation memorization. Cool, thanks. Yep, so uh, I'm Jack, and I'm a researcher at DeepMind, and I'm also a, um, a student at UCL. Uh, I'd like to thank my collaborators and advisors, Chris Dyer, Peter Diane, and Tim Lillicrat. The motivation for this project is that uh, neural networks are not very good at modeling classes that have been seen a small number of times. So maybe a class is new, newly introduced, or maybe a class is uh, very infrequently uh, observed. Um, and, and this can be quite problematic in many applications. Uh, so in the modeling of natural language, we see that uh, over time, words and phrases are introduced, and we'd like to be able to bind them quickly. And also, um, a common observation is that uh, the frequency distribution of the language uh, follows a power law, and therefore most words are actually very infrequent. So prior work, is, um, prior work with neural networks has tackled this by uh, augmenting a parametric uh, uh, neural network, a parametric classifier, uh, with a non-parametric external memory, which stores a history of recent activations and uh, corresponding class labels. So this has been successful in modeling, in improving the modeling of uh, new or unknown terms and also infrequent words. Um, however, one issue with this approach is that uh, this improvement is only beneficial for a recent history of time of which the memory uh, represents and stores. So once a, a rare word, say, drops out of the recent history, it drops out of memory, and we, we revert to the initial pro original problem. Um, one way to tackle this is just to make your memory very large, uh, but this has some computational and uh, space complexity issues. So we take a different approach. Uh, and we make a very trivial observation on the attention operator, which is listed uh, on, on the first line. Uh, so this is the attention operator from uh, the neural cache paper. So uh, attention here is a linear reduction over a kernelized inner product uh, between the hidden activation at the current time and the prior hidden activations uh, for the time steps where that class occurred within some recent history of the last n steps. And the, the somewhat trivial observation is that um, instead of storing each hidden activation separately uh, in memory, thus in an imbalanced classification problem, mostly filling up the memory with frequent classes, we can instead just have one uh, parameter vector per class, which is going to be the accumulation of all hidden activations corresponding to that class. So this is theta w. If we did this, then the actual conditional probability of a word or a class uh, given a current hidden activation ends up looking something quite similar to the original cache probability, except we have some kind of geometric average instead of an arithmetic average. Um, but the benefit is that we now can save a lot of space because we don't need to store uh, multiple uh, hidden activations corresponding to a different class, and therefore we can keep a much longer running history of information. So this leads to the model proposed in the paper, which we call Hebbian Softmax. Uh, it can be described very simply as a two-step learning rule, and I'm going to s remark on how this relates to the, the previous idea in a minute. But what we do is, we instead of having an external memory, we store th uh, our hidden activations directly into the weight matrix on the final linear layer of our, of our softmax output from our neural network. So this may be attached to something like a recurrent neural network if we're doing language modeling, but it could be attached to something like a confnet if we're doing image classification. And so it's broken down into two steps. The first step is just to perform a regular step of SGD, uh, which I've just written out here. Um, However, you don't have to use SGD. You could use whatever optimizer you want. Maybe you want to use Adam or an RMS prop or, um, or Adagrad. Um, the second uh, step is to, uh, for the active class parameter in this weight matrix, which is in this figure the highlighted uh, vector, uh, what we're going to do is interpolate the updated, um, uh, the updated parameter from our, from our gradient uh, descent step 
with the hidden activation uh, that was received to the weight matrix at that current time step. For all the parameters that were not corresponding to the active class, we don't do anything, we just uh, do regular gradient descent. So in the case of lambda is zero, this just boils down to regular gradient descent. And in the case of lambda is one, uh, this actually um, ends up being the Hebbian update rule. Uh, Wij is xi xj, where xi is the hidden activation, hd, and xj is the one hot target vector. So you can think of this as an interpolation uh, between a error driven uh, gradient descent learning rule and a associative Hebbian learning rule. And we find that the mix between the two uh, trades off a, uh, the benefit of fast learning with stable learning. And also, the general architecture has the benefit that it requires no or very negligible additional space and uh, time complexity as we are storing everything directly into those parametric weights. So we test this out on a, uh, well, we test, we have a, a few experiments. One is to uh, check for um, if we can learn and bind new classes faster. So we look at a very simple omniglot curriculum task where we start with uh, 30 omniglot images, we want to classify them, and when the, uh, the classifier reaches a uh, significant, uh, uh, an appropriately um, good classification error on the, uh, on the uh, validation set, we add another five images. So we want this thing to progress through the curriculum as fast as possible. The checked lines um, are all uh, architectures that use this heavy scheme, and the solid lines are all uh, the standard, um, uh, three different standard uh, optimizers, Adagrad, Adam, and RMS Prop. What we find is, in all three cases, uh, we observe faster learning when we use this updated learning rule. And all of these optimizers, we did, uh, we swept over hyperparameters to use the largest learning rate that we could stably progress through the curriculum. We also tested this on an imbalance classification problem, uh, specifically language modeling on the Wikitext 103 corpus. Here, the vocabulary is quite large. It's about 260,000 uh, tokens. So uh, there's some prior work which we list in this table on this problem. Uh, what we do is we train a pretty competitive LSTM that at the time of uh, writing beat prior baselines. When we added this Hebbian scheme, we found a drop of about two uh, perplexity. We also compared this to um, adding an actual external memory uh, to the network and using um, a combination of a neural cache and, uh, and, and memory-based parameter adaptation. And we found that this added an additional five perplexity drop, which gives uh, the conclusion that these things have somewhat orthogonal benefits. When we looked at where this performance gain was uh, made in terms of which type of words were we improving the modeling for, uh, by breaking this down, this perplexity down uh, into word frequency buckets, we found that there was a trend for uh, a, a larger um, drop in perplexity for infrequent words. So on the right, uh, we have words that we have a bucket of words that occurred less than 100 times in the training set, and we see a, an absolute difference of um, about 10,000 drop in perplexity. These numbers are very large for infrequent words because the modeling of infrequent words is inherently um, harder. However, for very frequent words, we, we see much less of a gain. Um, but this confirmed our hypothesis that we should be able to improve the modeling of infrequent words. Yep, there's some aspects of this uh, project that I haven't discussed in this um, presentation. Namely, we consider a few other learning update rules. If you'd like to talk to me, um, find out more, I'll be at poster 121. I'll probably be there a bit earlier than 6.15. I'll probably leave a bit earlier as well. Um, thank you very much for your time. We do have time for some questions. First time, it does not happen. Okay, no questions. Uh, well, I have a question. Um, so I'm a little bit um, um, curious about the big picture thing. How does this actually relate to the other stuff on memory augmented? Uh, you know, stuff that has been happening, and do you think there is some intersection that this, these ideas can be useful there? Yeah, so um, in the paper, we look at the conditional probability of a class um, with this scheme, and we show that there's some mathematical link between using that versus using essentially like an unbounded memory. Mm -hmm. um, the main 
the one thing that it does not capture that you will get in a, using a memory is that just the frequency of word occurrence um, can boost the probability when you use an external memory. Whereas in this, with this scheme, uh, if a word is occurring very frequently, it does not really change the how we represent the word and it doesn't necessarily give a boost. So there was some kind of prior benefit of just using an external memory and that's why we, we saw that there was a benefit when we added it on. Um, but in terms of the general, I think in terms of the general scope, there's also a lot of room for an interesting mix between associative Hebbian learning, which is essentially using a memory and gradient-based learning, and I don't think they necessarily have to be in separate places. They could all be in one parameter set. Maybe there could be some cool future work there. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. Okay, so our next speaker is Ben Krauss, and he'll be talking about dynamic evaluation of neural sequence models. Thank you. So yeah, like you said, I'm Ben Krauss from the University of Edinburgh, and my talk is about using dynamic evaluation to improve autoregressive sequence models. Autoregressive sequence models predict a probability distribution over sequences using an autoregressive factorization and can be used for density estimation and generation of sequences. The most familiar example to most people of autoaggressive sequence modeling will be language modeling, when a model predicts the next word in a sentence given the history of words. Many sequences, especially in language, contain reoccurring patterns or style. Uh, this is apparent in the text excerpt given uh, on the bottom of the slide about the Gambia's women's football team taken from a commonly used uh, language modeling uh, data set. So the names of countries, which are rare words in the context of the broader data set, appear repeatedly in this text. Um, furthermore, the words highlighted in blue all relate to competition and are specific to the style of this text excerpt. A model that can assign a higher probability to the local reoccurrence of these types of regularities has an advantage on this type of data. Static evaluation is the way that autoregressive sequence models normally assign a probability to a sequence. The model uses a hidden state to summarize the, the history of sequence inputs and then uses this to predict a distribution over future sequence elements. Uh, An LSTM is a typical example of what the model could be for this case. Dynamic evaluation builds gradient descent based updates into the model to to gain additional information about the sequence history. In dynamic evaluation, when evaluating the probability of a sequence or generating a sequence, the model first evaluates the probability of or generates a sequence segment, applies a gradient descent based update to update the weights on that sequence segment before moving on to the next sequence segment. By adapting to its own predictions, dynamic evaluation is able to assign a higher probability to sequences that contain reoccurring patterns and a lower probability to sequences that do not contain reoccurring patterns. Dynamic evaluation was proposed in Mikolaus' PhD thesis, but it has not been particularly well explored since then and its full potential hadn't been realized. We experimented with dynamic evaluation methodology and found several improvements, uh, including we update the model less frequently to allow more accurate gradient information to accumulate. We use a decay prior to bias the model towards the more recent sequence history. We use an RMS prop like learning rule, and we tune hyperparameters on the validation set, which we find to be especially important. So our first set of experiments were on word level language modeling on two commonly benchmarked data sets. Uh, we trained, we re-implemented the state-of-the-art word level language model at the time of writing and applied dynamic evaluation on top of this. Uh, we, um, we also compared with the neural cache method, which uh, was the, the state-of-the-art for adaptive word level language modeling at the time of writing uh, and um, has similar motivations to dynamic evaluation, although it's sort of specific to word level or large vocabulary like tasks. Um, the dynamic evaluation gave us large improvements uh, and achieved at, at the time the best ever results on these two data sets and uh, the state of the art has been further improved by applying our dynamic evaluation model to a stronger baseline uh, but uh, the state of the art on these two data sets still use dynamic evaluation.
character level language modeling could be seen as a more complex task, uh, especially from an adaptation perspective, because it requires learning longer range dependencies and has a greater degree of nonlinearity. And a lot of methods for word level adaptation don't work well for character level, level adaptation because, uh, because the task is in a way more complex. So we trained the state of the art character level language model at the time of writing uh, a multiplicative LSTM on, uh, on two, uh, two common character level benchmarks and applied dynamic evaluation on top of this. And we gained large improvements and achieved by far the lowest entropy ever achieved on either of these two data sets. And uh, in addition to achieving state-of-the-art results, the really big takeaway here is the weakness of normal static models, even when they're very well regularized and very large and trained on lots of data, uh, they're, they're still not able to capture these types of pattern repetitions and sequences, like in that example I showed you earlier about the Gambia's women's uh, football team. We ran some experiments uh, to, to gauge at what time scales dynamic evaluation is gaining an advantage over static evaluation. Uh, so we found that dynamic evaluation gains a notable, noticeable advantage if you have a couple sentences of conditioning text. So it's an adaptive method, so you need to have at least some text to adapt to in order for it to work well. And this advantage maxes out after about 2,000 characters of conditioning text, meaning that dynamic evaluation is using really long-range dependencies to make its predictions. We drew conditional samples from the dynamic and static versions of a model trained on English on conditioned on 10,000 characters of Spanish text. Um, the, uh, the final sentence of Spanish text is given on the top of the slide with the generated text given in bold. And this slide is the, the static model. So as you can see, when the static model conditions on 10,000 characters of conditioning text, you know, it, it's representing this text with the hidden state of an LSTM. It, uh, it just switches back immediately to English you know, because it, uh, it has no idea what it's just seen and it uh, is unable to, to adapt to it in any way. Uh, but when you use dynamic evaluation and you draw conditional samples, uh, you're able to generate, uh, generate text that has some real Spanish words and uh, a number of made up words with Spanish sounding features. And this is sort of a demonstration of the types of pattern reoccurrences that dynamic evaluation can learn to model on the fly. Uh, so dynamic evaluation has several potential applications. Um, so it could lead to improvements in speech recognition and machine translation over longer contexts. Uh, dynamic evaluation can be used to assign a probability density to any sequence, whether ground truth or otherwise. And while there are some complexities associated with decoding a dynamic model, this in theory should be doable. Uh, the most direct applications of dynamic evaluation might be to predictive keyboard and predictive search engine, which could both be seen as language modeling applications that involve a dynamically changing generating distribution. I also think dynamic evaluation may be useful for other modes of uh, sequential data, such as audio and video, as these types of data tend to contain reoccurring patterns as well. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I encourage you to ask questions and to come to our poster session tonight in Hall B. Thank you. So, any questions? All right. Uh, well, instead of asking a question, I'm going to save some time here because uh, it turns out that one of the pages in the booklet is missing from five to six. So if you looked into, if you looked into the booklet and you couldn't find the sessions from five to six, uh, don't worry, there is one. And it's there in the OA app and you can see the talks there. And I think none of the speakers have actually tested their equipment, so we need a little bit of time. So let's thank the speaker. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. And I would like the first speaker to come to the stage and test their equipment, and I hope things work out.
speaker of Deep Learning Neural Network Architecture 5 is uh, Hang Huang, and he'll be talking about decoupled parallel backpropagation with convergence guarantee. Thank you. Uh, okay. I'm Heng Huang. Uh, I'm a professor in ECE department at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, in this work, uh, I will introduce our recent uh, uh, research result on decoupled parallel backpropagation uh, with the con convergence guarantee for, for, for general deep learning architecture. So this is a joint work with my PhD student, uh, Zhu Yanghuo and Qian Yang, and my postdoc, uh, Bing, uh, uh, Bing Gu. Uh, in this presentation, first I will introduce the background, the problem, and the existing work. Uh, after that, I will propose our new uh, uh, decoupled parallel uh, backup propagation algorithm. Then uh, I will show our uh, major theoretical analysis, analysis results. Uh, after that, I will use experiments to show uh, our performance. And then I will conclude the talk and show our source code link. Uh, first, we, we, we all know that uh, deep learning now is a uh, very popular, widely used method uh, in many applications, uh, address a lot of complete vision, uh, natural language processing, biometric computing problems. Uh, it's very important uh, research topic. Uh, in, in current research, the neural networks are, be, are getting uh, deeper and deeper. For example, in 2012, when AlexNet wins the uh, Internet Challenge, AlexNet only has eight layers. Uh, at the 2014, when uh, ResNet wins the uh, Internet Challenge, it already has uh, 150, uh, 152 layers. So in past several years, the deep learning become deeper and deeper. Actually, the deeper structure gives us a bet better performance. Uh, however, the one of the key issues of uh, deep, learning, deep learning method is, is very slow. Now, even we use the, the, the parallel distributed algorithm, still uh, deep learning algorithm is very slow. Uh, one, one of the issues is that uh, we all use a uh, back propagation algorithm. Uh, for example, here uh, we use, uh, uh, I plot the three modules. So the a, module A, module B, module C to as a three layer of deep learning uh, feed forward neural network to show examples. So uh, H is a uh, activation function. So that's the that's for, for, forward part of the, the neural networks. Then, Uh, we also have the backward, uh, the, the data B, data, data A, they are the, the, the error gradient. So uh, in, deep, in deep learning structure, when we calculate A gradient, then we have to get, get the error propagated from B. So that means when we calculate A, we, uh, the gradient of A, we have to wait for the previous layer uh, calculation. So that's what we call locked. So the backward propagation basically lock different layers, such that we cannot uh, parallelize the uh, cal compute them. Um, in uh, existing li uh, literature, uh, researchers already test that uh, in, back uh, in the deep learning tr uh, uh, training process, uh, the, major, uh, the major computational cost come from the, back the backward propagation. Uh, for example, uh, this is one example using the uh, AlexNet. So if we see the comp comp computer time, we can see that uh, the forward time is uh, like uh, only half of the backward time. That means backward time will take uh, uh, more than twice of the forward time, uh, for forward time. So uh, in this work, we, we consider focus on how to parallel uh, the backward uh, path, because the current backward path basically they are locked by the backward propagation uh, algorithm. Uh, this is not a new new problem actually in uh, the uh, in, uh, in community. Uh, many researchers already noticed that uh, they want to try to. Uh, accelerate the backward com computations. So, for example, in 2016, uh, the decoupled neural interface method was, com uh, was proposed. Uh, basically, in this, uh, in this method, uh, the main idea is uh, they also want to break the, lo the lock uh, between the different layers of back, back propagation. So they, they use they call a synthetic, synthetic gradient. They break the, the, the back propagation using the synthetic gradient. For example, using uh, the other neural network to calculate this synthetic gradient. Uh, this, this is one method we proposed in 2016. Uh, the other method uh, uh, was proposed in, in uh, NIPS 2016. 
uh, is a, a, the direct uh, feedback uh, alignment. So basically, the, the idea is, is to use uh, uh, output layers errors to for to the different layers. So we don't do the, they don't do the back propagation. They directly using the error from other uh, output layers to other layers. Then uh, they uh, they try to uh, improve the computational uh, efficiency for deep learning training. However, both methods cannot work well when the deep learning, when the neural network are deep. Uh, when the new neural network are deep, the, the, the results are, are very bad. Uh, at the first, at the second slide, I show that the current deep learning network uh, go deeper and deeper. We only get a better performance. We get a deeper. We, we have to use the different uh, neural networks. So existing method uh, trying to block uh, unblock the uh, back propagation uh, don't work for the, um, uh, the the real deep ne deep neural networks. So with this uh, motivation, uh, we consider. Uh, try design method to deal with the backup propagation algorithm. So uh, this slide shows the, the, the basic uh, backup propagation algorithm. We can show that. We can see that uh, the H activation function. So uh, we, when we calculate the gradient for different for the L layers, then the second the, we use the, the using the chain, chain the chain rules. Uh, the second function we can see that the uh, for, for the current uh, for the current a, uh, L layers, we need uh, using the L plus layer uh, information because we need to get the uh, propagator information from the L plus layer. Uh, so that's mean we have we cannot compute the, uh, the level L independently. So we we cons we consider to uh, break uh, back backward locking by using the delayed uh, gradient. So my, the, the idea is very simple. So we can think about, for example, we have three modules. So when we calculate uh, the, the, the data A, the data A, uh, the, the errors, we don't use the, the back, the, we need to use the, the, get, get the, uh, the error propagated from B. So then we don't wait for the propagate. We use the last round, the last iteration uh, value. We call the delayed gradient. Such that we can, uh, every layer, they use the delayed gradient. Then every layer can independently do the computation. So in this case, we can parallelize them, let them compute in the different CPU. So uh, the, idea, the, the duration will become this, the, the backup propagation competition uh, after breaking the, uh, the lock. So every layer, when we, we, can, we can calculate their, uh, their, uh, their, their gradient using the, uh, the last iteration, because here is the T, uh, uh, is T minus capital K plus K, lowercase K, because every layer they have one delay, one delay iteration. Every layer has one delay iterations. So if we for the t, for the for the for the key layer will be t minus uh, in the t minus K plus uh, K minus capital K plus lowercase K. Okay. So uh, for the final layer is 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 a t is a using the t iteration uh, gradient. But when we do the back propagation, every layer will have one delay the gradient. Then based on this uh, calculation, then every layer can, use, can do their independent uh, uh, ca calculation for errors. So our algorithm, we further using the stochastic algorithm. We uh, using the delayed gradient plus the stochastic algorithm to update, uh, to update the, uh, the, uh, the error, the gradient for every layers. Then we can do the parallelization. Then we can easily do the parallelization for different layers. So the key point is uh, the algorithm is very simple. Uh, basically, we use delayed gradient, uh, break all the uh, different layers of the neural networks, then such that they can do computation uh, in parallel. Uh, the key point is we need to, we need to, show, we need to prove that with, with using the delayed gradient, we still can get a convert result, get the correct uh, deep learning training result. So our, 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 our major contribution is to provide the theoretical analysis to prove that uh, our uh, using the delayed gradient, we still can get, uh, uh, our neural network still can convert to the, uh, the number of cri uh, cri critical points. For example, uh, the first theorem we provide, we provide here is uh, uh, if we fix the step size uh, delta t, so the, for the for, you, for stochastic gradient method, we have the step size. First, if we use the, for, for, very, uh, for very naive ways, we can fix the step size. In this, in this case, of course, the will improve the dif uh, difficulty of the proof uh, on currency analysis. 
So even with the fixed step size, uh, we prove that uh, our con the convergence will, con will convert to the, the W W star is uh, the, the optimal result. We will we will come to a a number of the uh, the optimal uh, results uh, with 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 a sublinear convergence rate. So that's very similar to the uh, the regular back propagation algorithm. If we use the uh, diminishing step size, that means the step size will gradually uh, reduced and uh, satisfy this uh, uh, criteria. With, th with such step size, uh, the, the adaptive step size, actually our method can uh, convert to critical point. So we can show that. That means if in our experiment we show that using the uh, diminishing step size, we, we, can, we can convert to uh, the critical point as the, the regular the deep, new, uh, deep neural network. So in experiments, we, uh, uh, we, we test on the, the survey turn and several 100, uh, 100 data sets and uh, using the, the ResNet, uh, the ResNet. Uh, we, we test the ResNet 856 uh, and uh, uh, 112. So first, uh, we compare uh, our result with the back propagation. Uh, because we because back propagation, uh, we want uh, our result should be very similar to back propagation. We want to get faster speed, but still want to keep the, the accuracy. So we compare to two methods. One is the, the regular back propagation method for uh, deep neural, neural network organization. The, the other one is the, the decoupled neural interface. I mentioned it before. Uh, this method was pr proposed in uh, 2016. So. The result uh, we compare to these two methods we can uh, we show here. So first, uh, uh, we do the uh, the simple case. We do, we train them on the single uh, single GPU, and uh, we can split the position. For example, we only uh, in our method we can split split the neural network to key modules. So then the key module could be uh, the key could be uh, if as one. That means that's a regular uh, deep neural network. Uh, if key increase, that means split the neural network to much more uh, modules. If we three as two modules, then uh, the uh, the black line is a back propagation uh, uh, log log function result. Uh, our result is very close to the back propagation. That means we won't lose much on accuracy. Get a very similar result. However, uh, the uh, the uh, DNI method uh, decoupled the uh, neural interface method will get. Get, get a worse result. So that's the training errors. That's uh, uh, it's the testing errors. If we submit at uh, different positions, our method always converge. However, the uh, DNI method will uh, won't converge if we split the, the layer seven. So that means their method cannot guarantee always converge. It's different to our method. Then we also, also test if we split the uh, how uh, many modules because we want to see uh, what's the impact of the different number of modules. Uh, then we try, we see like two modules, three more, actually we try, try more. Uh, we will see that actually uh, the, mo the number of modules won't affect uh, our convergence results. So we still get a, a very similar load function result as a backup propagation. So that means we won't lose uh, accuracy compared to the standard backup propagation uh, optimization algorithm. Then we also, uh, that's a, we uh, test uh, on the res uh, eight network. Then uh, we also can uh, calculate a much much deeper network. We use the uh, uh, net 110, uh, and uh, using the separate 100 uh, data set, using the better size uh, 128, using one GPU to test uh, how about uh, the, the the accuracy and the loss function. So, so as a result, we can see that so our method uh, get get a uh, very similar accuracy as. A uh, standard back propagation method, and uh, however, our conversion speed will be faster than back propagation. So we get a similar accuracy and get, get a faster conversion rate. Uh, the conversion rate we get actually conversion rate is very is similar, but our conversion speed is is, is faster. Uh, because the advantage of our method is to unblock the different layers of neural network. The key point is to compare. Um, if we parallelize our algorithm on CPUs, uh, on GPUs, so how much speed, uh, how uh, how much we can speed up the algorithm? So, so we compare here. Then using one GPU, if we use one GPU to cal calculate the back propagation, uh, then we can here we will see for the forward computation time only take like one third. 
most of the rest, uh, more than two thirds, will be taken by the backward, uh, backward propagation. If you use one GPU, we also get a better, uh, get a faster speed. The, because our method by nature can be easily parallelized, because every every module can be uh, can can be easily parallelized on different GPUs. So if we use four GPUs, we can see uh, we can we can the speed is about two times of the standard back propagation. Then you may ask, then back propagation can be easily uh, can also be do the like using the filter method, uh, the filter method to do the uh, parallelization. However, if you use that method, they, they, they still have a lot of problem. The accuracy will be much worse. So our method can keep the same, uh, the very similar accuracy, but still speed up like two times. So in this paper, uh, we propose a decoupled back propagation algorithm using delayed uh, gradient such that uh, uh, the all the modules of the network can be updated in parallel without the back propagation, uh, backward locking. And uh, we also prove that the proof, uh, our new method have, uh, have the, uh, can guarantee convergence to the critical point for the non compromised problem. Uh, in this experiment, we can see that our, we can, our speed up is about two times of the standard back propagation method uh, using four GPUs. So we released the source, source code. Uh, it was written by uh, using the uh, PyTorch. Uh, my student, uh, Zhu Yan, released this code in the GitHub. So you please, uh, if you are interested in this uh, method, you can download the code to uh, test them. Uh, thank you. So we have some time for questions. Please go to the mics. It's right behind in the, in between the and have you observed the degradation and how much is it? Uh, sorry? What's so do you, uh, it uses, uh, introduces tail gradients. So at some point there will be degradation in accuracy, uh, right? Do you expect degradation in accuracy if you uh, oh, split it into too many blocks? Uh, we tried uh, like uh, split a quad of block. I think we showed in the paper and also in the slide, the accuracy all very similar to the backup propagation. Thank you. Uh, because in theoretically, we can prove that then the they will convert to the grid point, the neighbor of a grid point. Hi. Uh, my question is, did you try to fine tune the models you, you trained with a, with a fast method? Um, were you able to, and if so, were you able to recover the, the small accuracy drop you incurred? Uh, I, we, uh, how to say this? Basically, when we train different models, we use very similar ways to train them. I think uh, if we fine tune, uh, you know, the regular model and our method, maybe the performance could be, could be increased. But we just like uh, compare, uh, if we train like uh, different models, we use very similar, uh, similar ways to, 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 to tune the parameter. We don't really fine tune all the parameters. We, we, we try to, because the main, main, main point is we try to uh, keep the, set, the setup be fair for all the method, so to show how much different between accuracy and how much different between the speed. So we didn't really, really fine tune all the method. Okay, thanks. So we can take one more question, but I will ask the next speaker to come here and start setting up. The next speaker, please come and start setting up. We can take the next question. So one question. Um, when you did measure the back propagation, did you include some overhead occurring through the parallelization? And was it somehow happening on the CPU? And if you measured it, what is, was it uh, significant? Oh, actually, uh, we, 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 we include the over, so overhead. That's why if we like uh, split into the GPU, only like two times speed up, because there is overhead when we, when we uh, transfer between GPUs. So that means, uh, actually, theoretically, we expect much more uh, speed up, but in the real, we only, we only achieve like uh, two times speed up for, for the, for the whole, whole deep, uh, deep, deep neural network. Yeah, because we, we use multiple GPUs. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
let's thank the speaker again. So our next speaker is Melody Guan, and she'll be talking about efficient neural architecture search via parameters sharing. Hi everyone, I'm Melody Guan. I'm a PhD student in CS at Stanford, and I'll be talking about work I've done at Google Brain with colleagues, efficient neural architecture search via parameter sharing. So deep learning is all the rage now, and we use neural networks that were designed mostly by hand and tested through trial and error. And this is a very slow um, process that's very costly, and there's no sense of the optimality of the networks that we have found. And in 2017, work called Neural Architecture Search was developed to search for architectures automatically using reinforcement learning. Unfortunately, this approach was very computationally expensive. So the first NAS paper um, required 800 GPUs over three to four weeks. And then another paper came out on NAS that was somewhat more efficient. It still required hundreds of GPUs over a couple of days, but it was still a very computationally expensive approach that was mostly limited to use in industry. So in an effort to democratize this approach, we created Efficient Neural Architecture Search, or ENAS. And this allows us to run NAS using one GPU over a couple of hours. And we were able to achieve state-of-the-art on Pentry Bank language modeling at that time. And we almost replicated NAS's performance on image classification on CIFAR-10. So this represents a 1,000 to 50,000 times speed up over NAS. And this um, graph shows the bars represent the GPU days um, of the different methods, the two NAS papers, and as well as two extensions to NAS that came between those and our work. And then the numbers indicate the error rate. So you can see that ENAS is very fast and also has a low error on CIFAR 10 relative to the other approaches. So how do we achieve this efficiency? So the bottleneck of NAS is that we sample an architecture, and then we train it from scratch until convergence. And then we calculate a reward and use that to update the controller, which we use to sample architectures. And this means that we will train architectures and then throw them away after just getting um, one reward number. And that's very expensive. So we wanted to be able to to train while um, sampling different models. So we, we wanted to be able to share parameters between different models. But intuitively, this means we have to just stick to one architecture. So we fixed this problem by using a very large graph and then sampling child models that are paths or subgraphs within this large graph. And in this way, all the child models can share their parameters. So this allows us to, at each step, sample a different architecture and then train them continuously. And we use the uh, architecture to update the shared parameters as well as we can use the reward computed on the subset of the validation set to update the controller with reinforcement learning. And this, is, this works and it's kind of surprising but it was encouraged by work on multitask learning and transfer learning that showed that parameters trained for different tasks can um, be transferred to other tasks and work well even without too much changes. So we considered designing recurrent neural networks as well as convolutional neural networks. And we have three approaches, so one for recurrent cells and then one that develops entire convolutional networks, the macro search space, and one that develops convolutional cells, micro search spaces that we then replicate and then connect to form an entire network. 
So first I'll go into the RNN cell design. So the controller generates a sequence that describes a computational subgraph, and the sequence looks like this. And so at the first step, we, so first we pick a number of nodes. So in this example, we pick four nodes, and we pick this beforehand. And so for the first node, we receive the previous step's output and the current step's input, and we generate an activation function to combine these um, in this equation. And then for the second step, for the second node, we, we generate a new activation function and also an input index. So here the input is node one, an activation function is a ReLU. And we consider four activation functions, identity, sigmoid, ReLU, and tanch. And so for step three, we do the same thing. We sample an input index and also generate an activation function. So here the input is node two, and the activation function is a ReLU. And then for four, the input is node one, and the activation is a tanch. And so we have finished the four nodes, and we see that node four was not used for any, nodes three and four were both not used as inputs. So our final output is the average of their outputs. And this just gives an overview of all the computations. And so we notice in the equations that we have these parameter matrices. And so we have independent parameter matrices for each pair of nodes. And then we just use the ones that our controller decides to choose as previous indices. So now I'll talk about generating a macro convolutional network. And so as before, the controller samples an operation at each layer and also previous layer indices to perform skip connections. So here we consider six operations, which are max pooling, average pooling, depth-wise separable convolutions with filter sizes three by three and five by five, and normal convolutions with filters three by three and five by five. And note here that we allow for skip connections by allowing layer k to select up to k minus one previous layers as inputs that we concatenate. And we share convolutional kernels and batch norm parameters. Um, and so for the micro comnet, we, there are two steps. So first we generate a convolutional cell. And so the controller samples two previous indices, two operations to apply. And then on the second step, we replicate these cells to make the final network. Also, we can make reduction cells by sampling these computations and then applying strides of size two. And here we consider five operations, identity, max pooling, average pooling, and depth-wise separable convolutions, a filter size three by three and five by five. So to illustrate, we consider, again, four nodes. So to compute, layer i plus one, we start with the output from the previous two layers. And so, and those are our first two nodes. And then for node three, we sample, we make four decisions. So we select two indices and two operations. So here, the two indices that we select happen to be node one and two, and we choose operations, identity, and depth-wise separable convolution five by five. And then for node four, we sample um, nodes one and three, and then we have average pooling and separation um, three by three. And so we are done with our four nodes, and then the one node that has not been used as input is node four, so we choose that as our layer I plus one. So if node two had not been used, then we would concatenate node two and four and use that as the layer. So now we have described how to design these architectures, and so now I'll talk about training. So we have two alternating phases. So in the first phase, we train the shared parameters using gradient methods such as SGD, computed on sampled architectures, and the gradient comes from the craft entropy loss. And then in phase two, we freeze the shared parameters, and we train the controller using reinforcement learning algorithms such as reinforce or proximal policy optimization. 
And so after the ENAS process converges, we, we get the final architecture for our task by sampling N architectures and then taking the architecture with the best performance on a validation batch, so this is very fast, and then we retrain the architecture from scratch. So future possible directions for ENAS are searching directly on larger data sets instead of searching on smaller ones and then transferring to leaves, um, because we could expect different architectures in this case. Um, so, for example, examples of larger data sets are ImageNet and WMT translation data sets. And also, ENAS works really well for finding architectures, but not, we currently can't use it for other things such as optimizers. So there, there was a paper on using NAS for optimizers, but we can't use ENAS in theory because um, running optimization requires freezing parameters. Free freezing, um, where like, we need to update parameters when running optimization, but in phase two of ENAS, we want to freeze them. Yeah. I'm happy to take questions. Questions, please. We have a lot of time. Your talk was actually 20 minutes. Uh. <laughs> Hi. Uh, how did you come up with the number of nodes for an, on your search page? Like, did you tune that or did um, you it, It's chosen beforehand, so it's up to the person using okay, so, the process. Did you try with bigger number of nodes in your DAG? Or? Um, yeah, we tried. In practice, we, we tried different numbers. Okay, what about the performance, or was it better or worse? Um, it reaches an optimum at some middle value. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, how, do you, how does this compare, or ENAS and NAS compare to population-based training or other evolutionary algorithms for architecture search? Um, so I know there is a relatively recent or a paper that came out on evolutionary algorithms that did very well at the reinforcement learning methods. Um, so it depends on which model, like um, hierarchical NAS is also a evolutionary method that um, like develops submodules and then tries to combine them hierarchically, and that one does not do as well. Thanks. Hi. Um, uh, when you are using uh, parameter sharing, is there any, uh, have you ever seen any local conver convergence on local minimum? Because maybe parameter sharing might lead to the some local minimum. Yeah. Yeah, so as discussed in the paper, we do think that the models we found are um, local optimums, and we like we took the ones that we architectures that we found, and then like changed some of the um, like activation functions, um, and the performance dropped. So they seem to be optimums. So so the process does not guarantee a global optimum. And also, uh, using the RL, wait, uh, when you're using RL, you're using uh, Epsilon greedy algorithm? Um, nope. nope. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm not super familiar with the topic, but with the speed improvements, would it be possible to have another loop where you try to optimize a neural architecture search? Uh, to do neural architecture search? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that in the future, when we treat neural architecture search as kind of a black box, we will be able to do that. I think um, it could be tried right now as well. I think it will become more common in the future. Thank you. You can still ask more questions. We have, we have three more minutes. 
Okay, I have a, I have a question, okay. a high level question. Um, so I'm not super familiar with the topic either, but I was wondering, so you're doing some kind of discrete search um, and I used to think that it's a very hard problem. And so somehow NAS and eNAS is actually doing something interesting here. Do you think, so could you tell us like in high level, what do you think is the source of this imp performance improvement, why you're able to find better structures? Um, of NAS or eNAS over NAS? Uh, anything, yeah, NAS or eNAS, because I think they're doing much better than what we could do in, for example, model selection with any other things that I know. Yeah, so they allow us to go through a lot of different models, basically, um, that would, it's, it's like we're searching over a very large space of models um, in both cases. And then with ENAS, we just find a more efficient way of doing that. So you're saying you're doing more sampling, searching through more options, and that's what is giving you. So if you replace this by, a, let's say, some other search process, do you think you will have Yeah, the same so thing? we tried guided random search, and we did significantly worse in terms of the error. So we do think that the reinforcement learning and training the controller allows us to do a good job of finding good models. We did a number of ablation studies in our paper. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I'm not so familiar with the topic, but I'm just wondering, like, have you also tried other modules like attention or like some just uh, some wild um, modules, not just uh, say Confnex? Yeah, um, I think there was, maybe it's published research that was done on searching for attention, but basically like all, everything can be searched for with NAS and ENAS, except maybe optimizers with ENAS right now. Um, but what if, like, say you do confnets, but you don't want to search over the neighborhoods, you want to search over some, like, weird or interesting, like, recept receptive field? Like, can you imagine what might happen? Um, I, I don't see why, it w I think it should work, f unless there is some reason you would think it would not. <laughs> Um, I'm also wondering, like, have you also tried different kind of data, not just the uh, image? Yeah, so we have um, language modeling and image classification results. Okay, thank you. One last question then. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, has Inez come up with a kind of architecture where which you've not seen anywhere else or that's really just different from uh, what we usually design? Um, so I think the, one of the image one that were, one of the image classification architectures looked kind of similar to this other architecture, but I think the other ones were like very distinct and unseen. The language model ones? Yeah. Okay. And one of the other image ones, like there was a macro search space one and a micro search space one. Thank you. Yeah, so let's thank Melody for giving us so much time and relaxing <laughs> time for so much discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to introduce the next speaker and I'm probably going to s pronounce the name wrong. So I'm apologizing beforehand. Uh, so the next speaker is John Chang. Right. And he's going to talk about stabilizing gradients for deep neural networks via efficient SVD parameterization. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is John Zhang and uh, I'm from UT Austin. This is a joint work with Chile and uh, Professor Indija Dillon. So as we know, the, the deep neural networks suffer from gradient exploding and gradient vanishing problems, which um, recurring neural networks is rather severe in, in this problem. Because in RNNs, the weight matrices are shared, and this resulting, while well, doing back propagation, 
the gradient will uh, grow or vanish exponentially along the temporal dimension. Hence, it, it is hard for RNNs to capture long-term dependencies. And people used to solve this problem by gradient clipping, identity initialization, or uh, just using GRU or LSTM cells. So recent years, th there has been a new class of solutions proposed, which is uh, keeping the uh, orthogonality of the weight matrices or keeping the weight matrices close to orthogonal. This method include URN, ORN, or factorized RN. However, this method either lose expressive power of RNs or they have high time complexity. So here goes our method, the spectral RN, uh, which has four expressive power and have same training time complexity as RN. And it is easy to extend to non-square matrices. <coughs> So we maintain the weight matrix uh, using its SVD form. Here, sigma is a diagonal matrix of its single values. U and V are orthogonal matrices. To keep UV being orthogonal at all times, um, we further parameterize UV by a product of household reflectors. So a household reflector is a square matrix. It's itself orthogonal and uh, parameterized by a landscape uh, vector U. So because the product of uh, orthogonal matrices is orthogonal, then UV are kept orthogonal at all times. So basically we are trying to reparameterize the weight matrix, which is an n by n matrix, by a bunch of, uh, a product of a group of um, household reflectors, followed by a diagonal matrix containing the single values and another group of household reflectors. In this way, first we'll keep the single values ex explicit, and thus we can apply any constraint or uh, regularization on it. Um, also, the, we can prove that the image of this mapping, uh, if K1 equals K2 equals one, covers the set of all n by n real matrices, so we have full expressivity. Um, if K1 plus K2 less than N plus two, then we cover all the orthogonal matrices. <coughs> so considering that uh, a household reflector is invariant to scaling of U, we actually parameterize the N by N matrix uh, uh, by N square parameters. So there's no over parameterization in it. And it is easy to extend to non-square matrices. We just use the reduced form of, of SVD. And still we got same of the uh, same number of parameters. Thus it can be applied to MLP or fully connect layer in convolution network. So in spec spectral RNN, we uh, parameterize the W using M1 and M2 household reflectors. And uh, of course, if you select M1, M2 to be N, we get full expressive power. We can also show that the forward and backward propagation time is order MN compared to RN is N squared. Um, and we control single values in spectral RN by a shift and uh, scale of uh, sigmoid output. Thus, we can uh, constrain single values to be within a margin near uh, sigma star. And sigma star is chosen to be one in RN and M MLP, um, but chosen to be zero in ResNet because of the connection layer. <coughs> so in forward propagation, we want to evaluate W times H, which W is a bunch of household reflectors. And because of the structure of household reflector, uh, it can be evaluated with a uh, dot product between vectors and a vector addition, which causes only 2K flops. And the same goes for backward propagation. In backward propagation, we want to evaluate the gradient of each UK separately, and uh, each UK's gradient can be evaluated by two dot products and two vector additions. So this comes to a total uh, time complexity of order mn time. 
And we also approved the generalization bound. Uh, I'm not going to detail here, but uh, the take home message is that the generalization bound for RNN is directly related to the forbidden norm and the two norm of its transition matrix. So by constraining the singular values of W, we are, we are actually also constraining the generalization bound of the RNN. And we come to uh, some experimental results. We test our model on adding copying tasks, uh, which is a standard benchmarking uh, data set. And apart from uh, faster convergence and the lower test loss, we look at the gradient of the first hidden states. You can see that when L equals 30, everyone is good. Every gradient is stable, but when L equals 100, the LSTM and RN gradient oscillates a lot. And if we keep increasing the gradient, uh, the sequence length, the gradient of LSTM and RN just vanishes. Same goes for the copying tasks. And uh, we also test our model on MNIST dataset. We are able to achieve the highest accuracy with relatively um, low number of parameters. And also the permutative amnesty data set. Um, <clears throat> we expand our model to spectral MLP and uh, spectral ResNet. And on amnesty data set, we keep increasing the layer and uh, vanilla MLP and vanilla ResNet eventually fails with large number of layers, but uh, the spectral ones keeps give better performance. And uh, so the conclusion is we propose a parameter tra transition method that has explicit control over singular values, full expressive power, uh, low time complexity, and uh, better generalization. Our poster is tonight at uh, 181. Thank you. So we have some time for questions. Okay, I'm, I'm just gonna repeat the question that I asked before to somebody else. Mm. Uh, did you study the invariance properties of, uh, of your parameterization? Like, does it help with, you know, like compressing and then you can have some kind of identification problem that goes away when you start parameterizing it this way? Um, so we claim that uh, by using full uh, parameterization, we can arrive at full expressive power. Uh, actually, in our experiment, we found that using fewer number of household reflectors actually helps either in converging or uh, the training speed because you have less number of parameters. And generally, our uh, so deep neural nets are over parameterized. Okay, I think I understand, but thank you. Let's thank the speaker again if there are no other questions. So our last speaker is Randall Balestrio. Yes. I hope I pronounced yes. that right again. Good uh, enough. <laughs> and he'll be talking about spline filters for end-to-end -end deep learning. Yes. So I will present our solution to tackle end-to-end uh, -end learning for time series data. So first, to give you a little context, uh, time series data used to be largely unlabeled. This means that uh, given a task uh, not a long time ago, we had to uncraft features and see which one were uh, plausible physically and physiologically, 
and at the same time let good results. But recently, there has been a lot of interest in uh, time series and uh, time series related uh, studies. For example, uh, the impact of uh, human activities in uh, animal behaviors. Due to this, we have now more and more large scale labeled data set. So we would like to apply end-to-end uh, -end learning to provide the most performant uh, pipelines. If you try to take a deep neural network and apply it directly on the time series, which we denote X, you will have a really hard time to produce uh, good results, at least on challenging data set, even though you have a lot of labels. And this is due to new challenges. For example, you have very high dimensionality. So here you have just a 10 second recording sampled at 44 kilohertz. And you have already 10 times more parameters than uh, an image from the ImageNet dataset. Also, you have a lot of uh, different sources and noises. This means that uh, the feature or the pattern to extract will be altered because you have additivity of the waveforms. And finally, the pattern or feature to detect is usually very sparse in the overall signal. So for example, here to do the correct uh, prediction or classification in this case, you have to detect a feature which is only present in those uh, red bounded boxes. Due to this, current uh, solutions which employ uh, deep neural networks do not treat X as an input but a time frequency representation. So how to obtain a time frequency representation of X, you take a mother filter with this mother filter, you derive a filter bank by different deletions of this mother filter, and you use this to filter X. This gives you a representation which looks like an image. It's more intelligible, and this is fed into the deep network. With this, you have very good accuracies. So even though this time frequency representation alleviates some of the described difficulties of time series, you have a new question, which is, is this time frequency representation optimal for the data and task at end? So to answer this question, you can resort to cross-validation or you can call an oracle, but uh, it would be good to have a third option, which is to learn the mother filter used. So we will derive a learnable mother filter, but first we need to briefly review a little tool that we will use, which is a Hermit cubic spline. So it is a cubic polynomial defined in an interval here between zero and one, and it's uh, with coefficients uniquely defined by precising what is the value of this polynomial at the boundary of the interval by theta, and what are the values of the derivative of the polynomials at the boundary of the interval here by gamma. So now we can build our learnable mother filter. So it consists of a piecewise uh, cubic polynomial, except that we use the uh, Hermit cubic spine formulation for those polynomials. Thanks to these formulations, we can enforce easily some uh, mathematical properties to ensure that this filter can be used as a mother filter. So first, we need continuity, done easily by enforcing that the theta coefficients are the same for uh, adjacent uh, Hermit cubic splines. We need smoothness, so continuity plus continuity of the first order derivative done with the same type of constraint, but on gamma. And we also need centering and localization. So centering translates into a constraint on the sum of the theta. And localization is done by imposing that uh, the boundary of the filter is equal to zero and the derivative is equal to zero. Again, all of those constraints can be done easily via the Hermit cubic spine formulation. By leveraging multiple of the Hermit cubic spline, we can have enough flexibility to learn any desired uh, shape for the mother filter. So now that you have this mother filter, you need to derive the filter bank, which when applied gives you the time frequency representation. So to obtain this set of discrete filters, you will take a uniform grid and simply evaluate the analytical filter at the points. To derive all the filter bank, you do this with multiple grids, each with a different number of points. The more points, the more dilated will be the resulting filter. You thus obtain a discrete filter bank, 
you can easily plug it uh, instead of the standard uh, filters of a convolutional layer. And you know that applying those filters will give you as output a time frequency representation. Because all the operations they involve are differentiable, you can do learning of the mother filter and learning of the theta and uh, gamma coefficients. So to validate the proposed method, we use a large scale data set which consists of uh, 7,000 signals, each uh, 10 second recording at 44 kilohertz. And uh, the task is to classify if uh, each signal has a bird or not present in it. So it's unbalanced, you have uh, one positive or two negative. So the scores are presented with uh, area under curve. So to compare the result, we took a state-of-the-art deep learning uh, method that tackles this type of task and simply replace the fixed uh, time frequency representation with uh, either a completely unconstrained convolutional layer or the proposed uh, spline convolutional layer. So we can do two observations. First, the unconstrained convolutional layer does not reach even close the baseline method. And this even if we try to initialize uh, the filters with what can be considered as optimal using Gabor filters. On the other hand, the proposed method, even with uh, random initialization, is able to outperform the baseline method. And with some uh, clever initialization of this uh, spline filter, we can even further increase this gap. So on the right, you also have the one of the learned filters on top for the standard convolutional layer and bottom for the spline convolutional layer. So as a result, we have a simple recipe to provide a learnable time frequency representation, which is now the first part of a fully end-to-end -end deep learning method that can tackle time, uh, uh, sorry, uh, signal analysis for time series. Thank you. Questions, please. Sorry, that took me by surprise. I was not ready. Yeah, please go to the mic. The mic is right there, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So is there any previous work to try to design the time frequency filter in end-to-end -end fashion before? So there have been some work to try to learn filters such that they correspond to wavelet filters, thus leading to a time frequency representation. Mm -hmm. But it's been by imposing some uh, penalties on the form of the weight, such that during learning, they go toward being wavelets. But there has not been work which makes the filters belong for sure into the space of mother filters or wavelets. Okay, thank you. Have you noticed if the learned filters resemble anything we might be more familiar with? Um, some type of wavelet, for instance. You could say that uh, it's some type of uh, Gabor filter, except that the envelope is not uh, Gaussian, but more like a half circle. But then to make more analysis, you will need to have some expert knowledge on the data at end and the task you try to solve. How many spline nodes did you place there and what was the effect of um, the smoothness regularization? Uh, factors of smoothness, there is no smoothness regularization, it's enforced by construction in the filters and in this case we used uh, eight nodes for the spline. Oh, I see. Yes. Any other questions? All right, let's thank the speaker. And let's also thank all the other speakers uh, who have made it possible to finish uh, exactly at 6 p.m. Thank you.